Dan Deegan here and welcome to the first ever HPLS podcast. You know, I'm I'm so hyper excited to get this podcast out because I believe the value, the energy, the excitement, the joy that this is going to drive in your career. And I know a lot of you still are at that point going, Dan, come on, man. Do you really think I'm ever going to really love picking up the phone to make sales calls? And my answer is yes, you will. I think if you hang around with me long enough, you are going to love the fact that you have to prospect in cold call. And I couldn't think of a better person to bring the first ever HPLS podcast to life than my dear friend, Bob McKenna. Not only is he a dear friend today, Bob was actually my first customer in this industry. And in this podcast, we talk a little bit about those first days in the industry, you know, where it's evolved to, where the customer relationship has evolved, how the market today coming into the end of 2019 into 2020, how it's kind of affected. And not to mention a lot of other things that we talk about, like what it means to be a real pro what it means to really understand what you're doing and why that's important for both your sake and the customer and supplier's sake. So I hope you enjoy this first ever HPLS High Performance Logistics Sale Podcast. Again, I'm Dan Deegan, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Remember, my friends, go out there every day and crush your sales and make every call a learning experience. Enjoy the podcast, and we'll talk to you soon. So I figured since, again, since this was going to be, you know, the first ever HPLS High Performance Logistics Sales Podcast, I bring to you the first ever customer and one of my best friends in this industry, Mr. Bob McKenna. So... When I first met Bob, I would, uh, some people would say, I say I still smelled like pee. Um, I was a young buck. I remember getting into Newark, New Jersey airport and realizing that I was even too young to rent a car um, to get to go see Bob. And so Bob and I have been through quite a few uh, interesting adventures. I'm going to call them throughout the years. You know, one thing I've, I've always loved about Bob is he's gone from traffic manager to broker, warehouse, driver, you know, back on asset side. So Bob's been all over the map. So for everyone watching, listening, wherever you are, however you're consuming this, um, this is going to be a really, really, really awesome half hour, 45 minute conversation. So Bob, welcome. And you know what, brother, I just got to say thank you for being you. Thank you for, I mean, we go back and forth when it comes to the thank yous because brothers, it's always a two way yeah. street, but you know what, buddy, to be, it's a gift. It, you know what, when I was 17 and I got into this industry and, and you said, yeah, okay, I'll deal with you, um, you know, it was it was pretty cool because I'm, I'm well, there's actually... More, there's a great deal more to that story and your <laughs> yeah. persistence prevailed. Yeah, yeah, yeah It is yeah. a definite example of perseverance, um, very much winning over talent or know-how or anything else. You did not give up. You learned as you as you went and you retained and you truly were looking to build long term relationship with customers, which I think is is a terrific way to do business. And I think, unfortunately, it's trending out of the the norm. You know, I agree with you, Bob. It's you know, I I mean, thank you for that. I always kind of wanted that long-term customer but you know what i did find is through those first part of the years it was like i want long term and then i would get real lazy at sales and i wouldn't do anything and my numbers would kind of drop and then and, and i see a lot of sales people doing it and my numbers would drop and then all of a sudden i'd be looking for that quick hit right that quick dopamine you know that quick fix that we think is kind of quote unquote long term but i'd be going to that guy that was just looking for numbers and then four months later, when somebody else beat my numbers, be like, what the fuck are you doing? What? Like, how, I've just served you for four months and given you everything you want. And so I, I appreciate that because I'm trying to preach that to every single student and everyone I work with that, guys, if you're in this for the long run, why would you bother dealing with customers for short term? Well, my personal take on that, and and I can attest to that even today in the heavy haul specialized arena that I'm currently in. Mm-hmm. The it's very easy to get a big hit, say a 
seventy, eighty thousand dollar thirteen axle load out of a one time gig that you're up against or a customer that's naive and doesn't know. But from my experience, my the longevity, the most profitable to me is those relationships I'm making where I may start it may have been just one little call they made to move something minute. But because of the customer service that we provided them, myself, my team, they then grow into, okay, you know, they did a great job at this one. You don't know who's on the other end of that phone or what their potential is until everyone, I guess what I'm getting at is everyone should be treated the same. Yep. And, and especially initially, because I have ones that have now opened to that they're a couple million dollar a year contracts started from a $1,700 flatbed move. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now we're moving their tanks. We're moving their enclosures. We're moving their gen sets. We're, you know, so it evolves. And and I think again, to a testament to your initial process, and I think you taught me some things as that because I was on the traffic end of that coin at that time, where that persistence and that, hey, it's five o'clock. I shut my phone off. Bullshit doesn't work uh -huh. you know you got to be there when that customer is in a jam on a sunday morning yep and you know what they don't forget and if they do then you do weed out and and again you're constantly filling your pipeline you're also taking out of that pipeline that customer that is just price shopping you you know yep. i have a value added service it's me it's you you know but you have to be that you can't profess it and not be it so i got a question for you bob because i i, I... I love how you phrase that. How do you identify tire kickers and how do you get rid of them? I identify them typically by you would start when they're when they're kicking the tire for the first time and they ask you for a rate and you give them what is a fair competitive rate. And again, you have to know your market. You give them that number where you would like to be. Well, then as they if they don't react to that. You get no business. Well, then you kind of dial it down a little. You try to find where that sweet spot is. I I will dial it down to the lowest possible part of that sweet spot. I can go and still be profitable. If they don't bite at that point, I'm sorry. Our services and your cost expectations don't align. Yeah, not congruent. Uh, yeah, I can't I can't compete in the market apparently that you're delving into. And I've had that come back as a positive sales thing. Well, you know, people may say, oh, you're cocky or whatever. No, if you know your business, you know how much on the asset side, if you know what it costs you to operate that truck, you're 10 times further ahead than 90% of your competition. Very few trucking companies can identify their costs accurately. Yep, I agree. I agree. And uh even less brokers can even identify what carrier costs on average across the board are. Um, do you do you find that in your business and and for context for everybody listening and watching, um, you know Bob's business is specialized heavy haul OD. Um, I just actually was it beginning of this week I think it was no middle of last week. You guys just got a thirteen axle. Uh, I mean, what a beautiful piece of equipment. We're Rear steering 13 axle, so Rear we can get in a post camp. Yeah. Why? Wow, see, now, I mean, that is seriously specialized equipment. I mean, just looking at the pictures of it, I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, it's some beautiful stuff. Um, you know, do you, do you guys have, because you're so specialized, do you ever have brokers call? And if you have brokers call, what would you, for any broker watching that's in kind of that specialized arena that wants to be a pro, that wants to really perform in that specialized arena what are some of the things you can share with them to to really help them bring up their game so a when they call you the deal can get done i'm not going to say quicker but but more streamlined i guess is the word i'm looking for and then b just to help them raise their game brother what can you suggest well as as when you and i were brokers not only are you selling to the car the customer you have to sell to your carrier mm -hmm. so you have to establish carrier relationships so for that person that wants to get into this industry as a broker, and we do deal with a lot of brokers, um, know what it is 
you're asking for. If you're unsure, ask the questions. If the carrier isn't willing to expand those answers to you or pass them on, you don't want to deal with that carrier anyway because you want it to be a relationship, a partnership. I often, as you know, my brother is a broker. So I have been over the course of probably the past year educating him on those things you need to know to convey to your customer because in this market the customer isn't just looking for okay you're doing it a dollar 25 a mile this guy's gonna do it a dollar 20 so i'm going a dollar 20. it's high value it's very very um special to them oftentimes it's something that you can't you cannot replace easily it takes some weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years to replace. So the more educated and and descript your conversations are with that customer, the more likely you are to gain their business because they aren't always looking for that cheapest rate. They're looking for who is going to get their product delivered as they shipped it 2,700 miles away through with bucket trucks lifting wires and you know i mean it's just I, I guess the long story short is i've always found that the more honest and open you can be with a with a customer that also cultivates that long-term relationship the flash in the pan you don't get that but you don't have that conversation and oftentimes the more you educate and not to a, you don't want to over educate your customer, but the more you you can convey to them that you know and you understand and what it is their expectations and needs are, the comfort factor that they're going to have for you is is increased exponentially. So, what do you mean by not over educate your customer? Well, as we all know, we don't want to give them too much information to make them too smart that they no longer need us. Yeah, but, okay, I get it. <laughs> I get that. Part of it. Yeah. Money on the table if you if you don't. But again, a fair and competitive rate is the right way to do it. When you try to rape somebody, it's going to come back and bite you in the ass. Oh, one hundred percent. I mean, I, you know, I remember when I <laughs> when I, I remember first starting in the industry when uh, you know the the quote unquote um, technique or the training was oh no no you're calling U.S. companies for a backhaul. And you pay backhaul rates as if coming out of the U.S. cost less than going into the U.S. when it came at miles a mile, a dollar is a dollar. Um, you know, but okay, you know, I'm, I'm young. I, I buy into that right away. And it's like, okay, I'm backhauling. Now, as opposed to the proper sell would have been, I deal in Canadian dollars, you deal in U.S. dollars, you get a 30% because at that point it was a buck 30 or something exchange rate something crazy buck 42 at one point so i mean we were almost 50 50 on the dollar amount um so anytime i heard somebody saying oh well i use yellow to go to canada it was like chi ching (laughs) first of all you're gonna pay a yellow 1700 us out of tennessee i'm paying 800 canadian which is really 460 dollars us um there's a big margin in there right but Today's salesperson, today's day and age, with the market the way the way you see it today, I mean, there's much very 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 big differences on what we have to do as salespeople. And I believe, just as you said, that education piece is one of the most critical pieces. I mean, uh, and and tell me if I'm wrong here. Here's kind of how I position it, and I love your feedback on it. So. I often talk to my students and I talk to groups of people and everyone I train and I say, listen, a traffic manager and you being a traffic manager, you understand this, you know, they don't want to deal with people that don't know what they're doing because their job's on the line. I mean, not maybe not necessarily getting fired, but they are get friction at their job. They get in fire from their boss when you screw up because you have no idea what you're doing in your market, the specialized market. I could see that becoming a major factor as opposed to just, hey, I got two skids going here, I got four skids going here. It's just G- FAK and it goes across the board. Um, when we're talking in that specialized market, I guess the, the big roundabout for this really long-winded kind of brain dump <laughs> on you here to, to get to the roundabout of it is um, when it's specialized, Give us three to five things that everyone should know before they call a specialized carrier. 
about the particular move? Dimensions. Mm-hmm. Um, and accurate dimensions, because that's something that'll come back and bite you. Okay. Uh, you're you're going to want to you're going to want to have in front of you or offer to the carrier or whomever what the expectation is from the start. Say what you're looking to do. I need this moved from Oregon to Alabama. I've got two weeks to do it, or I have this be, because each component affects the next. Mm-hmm. Um, what it, what is it? that I'm that I'm looking as the shipper what are any of the other criteria that will influence this transportation because one in this there's curfews you are only allowed to travel at certain times and, and every state is different there's permitting which is very particular to the sizes you know once you get to a super load level frost laws that are in the, the upper U.S. and I'm sure in Canada too where you mm-hmm. can't travel at certain times because of the frost. Um, height restrictions, there's a fine line between where it's a regular permitted load to an oversize or to a super where you now may have to have bucket trucks, escorts. So again, all of that information, you don't want to keep anything tight to the vest that involves the shipment. You need to put it all in and to go back to what you were saying earlier about what these new salespeople can do and ask the customer what their expectations are manage those say what is most important here is it price is it service what's the value of your shipment because sometimes those two skins you're talking about i remember a guy who used to ship two skins sometimes for these imax theaters <laughs> that would be worth a million friggin dollars yeah i remember so, that i remember that guy too i know him pretty well yeah, <laughs> but as so again, I don't think it's ever. As soon as you start generalizing, or you think you know it all, it's like riding a motorcycle. When you think that you're better than that bike, that's when that bike's going to get you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? the more you are willing to continually learn, and you're there to learn from your customer, your customer can learn from you. And when you can convey that true relationship of I'm looking out for you, we're partners, we are partnering on this, I'm an extension of you. Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's heavy haul or it's LTL, if you're shipping widgets that have no value. Well, again, it's going to change those parameters and the the quali- quantifying factors for the decision making process but understanding that and if you don't know you ask how else are you going to know researching your customer if you're if you're prospecting get on google we didn't have that no. <laughs> you know what no. I mean? no mr but, googs is an awesome friend at times yeah yeah i mean the, the hunter the sale um the rocket that you add to the Google that you could find emails and addresses of what have you LinkedIn, which you are the guru of LinkedIn, any of these social medias, use them to educate yourself before you make that call. Because me on the other end of that phone call, you're calling on me. The more you show that, Hey, you really want this business, the better chance I, you have of me giving it to you. If you're just calling and tell me, Hey, I'm the best. I'll, I'll, I'll be anybody's number. Yeah, go ahead. I got 30 of them calling me every day. Mm-hmm. What makes you any different? Make yourself different. Be somebody as you were. Bob, you know, I'm going to call you every day. I'm going to call you every day. What happened? You took every piece of freight I had to Canada for how many years? Years. Uh, until you uh, left. Uh, and then until yes. until the, you know, I'm, I'm, it's funny because, it, you know, we get into this conversation and it, it comes back to something I've said from the beginning that you don't buy a company you buy the individual. When you were a traffic manager, you bought the individual. You didn't buy the company. You didn't buy what uh, the logo I was flying sold. You bought me. And when you left and the new person came in, we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of that. And after many, many, many attempts, it was just, okay, no problem. It was all about price at that point where it was nickel and diming, nickel and diming, nickel and diming to the point where it wasn't profitable and I actually ended up walking away. Um, you know, sometimes salespeople get caught up in that. And, and sometimes I found also salespeople, um, you know, to go back to something you said earlier, when you talked about 
you know, give me the details as the guy that's going to halt, <laughs> right? There's oftentimes this fear, this paranoia, something, especially I've found more in industries like yours, where there's a core few people you can go to, right? When, when you're talking getting bucket trucks and you're talking 13 axle trailers, you can probably rhyme off your entire competition across the North American continent in 30 seconds flat. So if this broker's got an opportunity, I guess the fear, the concern, the paranoia from them sometimes comes in, well, if I give Bob too much information on it, he'll just get the freight direct. Share with us what the reality is of that. Surprisingly, it is an expanding market. So the competition is getting greater and greater, and I could not do that 30-second thing. I mean, oh, there really, really are okay. guys coming up daily. Um, the reality of it is, market. yeah, it's expanding. More, okay. It's like anything else. They see there's money in it, so people are expanding into it. Unfortunately, you don't, as that broker, you don't want to get hooked up with somebody who is basically blowing smoke and they got your piece of freight on for your customer and they don't know what the hell they're doing and they, they can't move because they didn't have to pull permits in, in Indiana. So they're okay. sitting there for a week. So the, obviously you know I mean? when you get to that neighborhood, okay, so I guess let's pause on that question because that, that posed something else that I think everybody yeah. watching is going to want to know is how do you know what companies are awesome and what companies to avoid is there anything on like safer stat to go to is there websites is there somewhere that Safe, you can share yeah, safer stats a great tool obviously a website if they have a, a, a more modern and and attractive website they spent money on it so if you're spending money you got to have money so you i mean that's one assumption or some things obviously it's a series of things to check but the best is to talk to them and when you when you're talking to somebody that actually sounds like they know what they're doing. You'll know because you'll know the other ones that are blowing smoke up the proverbial what have you. But mm -hmm. the reality of like you're getting at the fear of too much information. The actual reality is companies like ourselves really have no extensive sales force because a lot of it has been mom and pop. It's family oriented. Um, a lot of word of mouth. So in my personal uh, thought process mm -hmm. is the more solid relationship you can build with the brokers, they become your sales force. You don't have overhead. You don't have, so you can work the deal say, listen, okay, where do you need to be? This is, let's, let's truly attack this as a partnership. I know you need to make money. You know, I need to make money. Where do you think we could be? Here's this. If you, if I give you a number, you bid your customer, your customer comes back to you and says, ah, I really need it to be $5,000 less. Well, you're a fool if you don't get on the phone with me and say, listen, here's where we're at. This is the response I got. What can we do? Yep. Mm -hmm. Because there may be times you can't do a damn thing. There may be times we can say, you know what? How much business might comment to you if you were the, the, the broker approach? Yeah. yeah. How much business are you estimating this to be? Where could this grow to? Um have you done other work for them in, in this in this specialized market? What's the nature of your relationship with them? Are you pretty strong? Is it like your brother-in-law? Where are we going with this? Because that will determine, all right, listen, I'll drop my drawers on the first couple to help you get the business, but then you forget me. Then the next time you call me for a raid a year from now, I'm going to forget you too. Yep, 100%, yep. 100%. You know, it's funny. I, I started this um, just before I... I I actually started HPLS and, and, and took a shift in the, in my, um, in my uh, career, if you will. Um, I, I created something that's called REL reverse engineered logistics. And what I often tell salespeople now is I said, you know, go to five of your top carriers, five people that, you know, are ironclad. I mean, good people know the business, have the same values, ethics, morals, beliefs about, customer service about you know being profitable about everything so it really oh, surround yeah 100 percent. really surround yourself with the people that believe in what you believe in so i went to people that believed that this industry is the 
most amazing industry on the planet. I, I would take trucking over being a doctor, heart surgeon, brain surgeon, any of the above, because nowhere in, in no industry, probably besides computers, can you do a 360 and everything you see has touched a truck. Right. Oh, if you bought it, a truck brought it, brother. One hundred percent. I mean, computers would probably be the next, just because of how everything's going digital in our homes. You know, so you can do a three hundred and sixty, and you're going to run into fifteen, twenty computers, cell phones, whatever. So technology is is another game. But when we talk industry wide, billions of dollars on the table, hundreds of billions of dollars on the table. I always say, why are you guys fighting for the scraps? Like. Companies can become 13, 14, 15, 20, 30, 40 billion dollar companies. Give me 1% of that pie. Give me 0.2% of the pie of transportation and I'm set, my family's set, and their family's set. Like my kids and their kids are set for life. So stop scrapping over the bullshit bottom of the barrel. Find the five people that you love working with that provide the same values, the same customer beliefs, the concepts, the ideas, where you can go in and you can sit down like what we're doing right now and have our conversations and really understand what's going on at the grassroots level. Because let's, let's face the facts. When I was a broker, sure, I was a salesperson. But I didn't dig the trenches, brother. You did. Like, you're digging the trenches at your company. I'm not. So I count well, on you for the knowledge and I, in, at your values and how you want to serve customers, how you want to be the top tier people to go to for your business, I, told, I tell everybody, surround yourself with those people. Find out what they need and go and sell that. And then when you go and sell, you have capacity, you have costing, you have transit, you have an ironclad belief, Teflon belief about what you can do. It's not this BS that we saw in 2018 where I got trucks in Texas. No, you don't. You have no yeah. trucks in Texas because Texas is a nine to two state right now. So there's two trucks for every nine loads. So unless you own those two trucks, you got shit, my friend. Let's be <laughs> true, right? So what do you think of that? That was a big rant. <laughs> I, uh, I absolutely agree, but I would have to bring back some of our past again. Mm -hmm. We have successfully, time and time again, like I, I made mention earlier, you're selling not only to the customer, but to the carrier. Mm -hmm. When you understand your carrier's capabilities, potential, where they're looking to grow. And again, that's by conversation, spending time with them. The people you aligned with ethically, morally, um, you know, service. Or in, <coughs> it's easier to sell what you believe in the most, correct? You have to. So when those, when those alignments come come into play. You now could go to customers, you could target customers that the carriers you're comfortable with, it fits. It's a win-win. It's I go into people to this day, and especially selling for who I sell for and who I'm affiliated with. They, Whoever initiates the meeting, one of the first five-minute sentences that comes out of my mouth, we will never be the cheapest. Mm-hmm. I've had people ask me why, because we don't want to be, we yep. can't afford to be, and we we value your business enough that we can't ever do it. Mm -hmm. You're only ever going to see our truck, You're, and it's going to be clean, and that equipment is has just gone through a maintenance bay before it came to you. So if it's something that's breaking, it's something that's unforeseen. Yep. So we are taking every step we can to, to provide you with the best carrier that we could be so in that don't nickel dime me or uh, it's great knowing you someday you're gonna need me but if that's what you're here to do or you want me to do we're not compatible at this moment mm -hmm. i agree so, i agree but don't ever sell yourself short or think you have to be the cheapest to get the business because you don't want that business anyway like you said earlier you're mm -hmm. you, you, you want to be the bottom feeder well i mean i mean you know let's look at Okay, so I, you know, obviously I'm sitting here in Canada. You're in the U.S. We're, we're, you know, I when I left, I was in a little bit of a specialized market, more on the stone, flatbed, that kind of thing. Um, never really dealing with, you know, your level of 13 axles, bucket trucks, you know, move moving power lines up so we can get through and all that. I've had the, I've had 
multiple shipments in my career doing that, but nothing that I did on a standard, re on a regular basis. Um, I know in can the Canadian economy, pretty soft. Um, you know, you, you, you get articles from like freight waves and all this. Oh, you know, freight's up here, freight's up there, freight's doing this, freight's doing that. What do you see as the big friction generators in the U.S. right now? And what do you see coming, you know, specifically into that, you know, beginning part, excuse me, of 2020? Um, what do you see happening, brother? Honestly, I think it all comes down to talent would be the word I would use. It can then you could have lack thereof. Um, you could have um, loss of. I mean, there's so many in this industry and what we see here from the driver who the industry went driver short for the longest time. We dropped the standard of how you can be or who will put behind a wheel just to put shippers never came up with the numbers where they should be. I mean, you still have rates basically that are no different than they were in 1985. I, I agree with that. Yep. So, yeah. But could you get a group of truckers to stick together and hold firm? Hell no. I don't know why. Gabados, as the Italians say, maybe. But from that lack of either education or talent, it may not all be talent. We may not be educating those drivers correctly. We're not educating the people handling the freight on the docks correctly. We're not educating the people that or billing, or or um, any any of the steps along the way from in freight movement, you have a lack of people that really understand the industry. And years ago, you learned from starting to push a broom. Then you may become the CEO, but you got pieces of the whole picture. And I mean, I had the pleasure of growing up in fam family businesses. But from the ground up, I was never given anything, as you well know. Yep, yep. But maybe not being the best at any one thing, understanding the whole bubble makes you a better transportation professional at any level. Operationally, sales, driver. Why does What does this paperwork really have? Do people even know the legal ramifications of a bill of lading or what's required to be on a bill of lading? Or the old Section 7 on a bill of lading that if you were a shipper and you were a shipper with a broker, you would you would have on there so that if the broker didn't pay the carrier, they couldn't come back at you. Sometimes as an asset sales representative, you may want to bring that to light. Say, hey, listen, I know you got me up against brokers, but did you understand that where your liability lies here? Do you understand the, the, the cargo um uh, cargo insurance, what the value is. Okay, well, 150000 and your cargo is 300000 You're getting a cheaper rate, but if one of those trucks go over, there's 100 trucks you could have shipped at the right rate. Yep. You know, it, it's. I read, um, so I've been following up on these <laughs> mega settlements, right, which is, is all the buzz right now. I think they call them nuclear settlements or nuclear awards is the kind of the catchphrase that's happening now. Um, where companies are, are, are judges and juries are awarding individuals like $40 million for, for accidents and, and tragic deaths. So don't get me wrong, I'm not downgrading that. But they actually had an article I read the other day where really getting into that deep level of where brokers' liability lie. And something as, like, literally, I've done a million times in my career, my driver, sending a customer to an email. So I hire you for something and I send my customer an email and say, my driver from, you know, is going to be there at this time and your driver from your company. Liability. One, and I was blown away and I said, are you kidding me? And it's, <laughs> I mean, I knew, I knew back for years now because it start when HOS changed and all the hours of service changed. There was a huge push on brokers saying, you know, you can't dispatch my driver because you're forcing my driver to go do something and da da da. And that was the case. I mean, I remember back in the day when I first started, it was, what do you mean? You've been on the road seven hours now. You know, 
you, you can't go to bed. And it was the driver was like, listen, I'm exhausted. Like, I just didn't sleep. I need to get some sleep. And uh, uh, hey, hands up, first one to admit, I'm guilty of saying, no, that's BS. You're, you're not. You, got, you told me you were going to make a delivery. And then the guy ends up making a delivery. But in that time, that's a very critical stage. So that kind of went away a little bit with HOS. And then some brokers started being sued because they were dispatching. But something as simple as that email to a customer to say, my driver puts immediate liability on me and my company. And you think about it, how many major brokerage firms, you know, the billion dollar companies. And as a broker, you probably don't have general liability coverage to the level that you should for that. Possibly, possibly. I mean, you know, I've seen, you know, negligence insurance at 5 million at this, but when you're talking a $40 million award and they're saying, oh, and by the way, 50% 50% of that's coming from the broker and 50% is coming out from the asset carrier. Like just that, that one, uh, the RV company, the, the trucking company that own, all, all they did was transport RVs and I forget the name of it, but they, they had an accident. They were messing around. There was two trucks playing chicken and I don't know if the RV company was kind of in the middle or something. There's two different stories about it, but none of them are connected. As always. Yeah. So I, you know, I guess they might've been, you know, pissed off at each other so they're kind of road raging or whatever it it ends up truck comes out hits a a head on and there's like close to a a 40 something million dollar settlement well that settlement 20 20. 20.6 million of it went to this rv company put them out of business instantly put them out of business right so you think about it and you say you know yeah i got negligence insurance if one of my employees and this is from a brokerage end if one of my employees screws up you know, I got 5 million, 10 million, but when these like serious nuclear awards are being handed out, who the hell's prepared for that? Do you know what I mean? That's crazy. I don't think you can, you know, there's no way to prepare for that. And I mean, there's more factors involved in there too. And how liberal things have become. And I mean, there's, but that's political and that's not for here or there nor there, but the the other portion of all of that and and how one if one begets the next it goes back to that managing your customer's expectation like you said how many times a broker will just get a truck send them in there well maybe you should ask your customer that guy's out of hours he's an hour away and he's out of hours by the time he picks up well if this is something that's got to deliver tomorrow has anybody thought of Say to the customer, listen, I can get you the truck. We're not going to be at the rate you want because I don't think there's a truck out there. Four o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday, you're going to be hard pressed to find a driver that's got hours left to push through tonight. Yep. So, and uh, being the customer in the past, the guy came to me and gave me the skinny of the truth. Listen, it's going to cost you $500 more, but I got a guy. I got a, I got a, tease him got to put the carrot out there for a little more money to get his driver who just woke up he's got 10 hours ahead of him i've elected yes i'll spend that extra 500 dollars to get it there and you can put the caveat in a rate in the, in the rate confirmation and vice versa or the, the yeah. customer can ask but the more co- i ran into this the other day i had our billing department come back to me and complain that they had to speak to customers that we should have certain things ironed out prior. And I said, I beg to differ. I said, every conversation you can have at a different level in the same organization entrenches you further. You as the biller, you know what? Make that relationship with the accounts payable person over there. It comes down to it. They're going to, they got 10 bills in front of them and they can only pay five. They got a relationship with you. You're the guy to make them laugh or you call and say hello every once in a while or you remember that their kid's birthday or their anniversary. They're going to pay you first. That's a great point. That's a the, great point. At the, at, at the more more levels of touch points, is that the right terminology? Yeah, more levels of connection, more levels of touch points. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. The more valuable you are to your customer, hence that true partnership thing. And let's face it. Majority of customers become lazy and complacent. As long as you are providing the service that 
makes their job easier. They can get that off their plate and move on to the next hat they're supposed to wear that day. You can bring your rates up to to where they need to be, but prove yourself first. Show me, don't tell me. And as long as you're taking care of all these little things, that value-added service is immeasurable. So when if they take you out of that equation and try to plug another carrier in there, who isn't talking to Sally and accounts payable and Jose and billing and um, Joey on the on the dock on the dock floor loading the trucks. You've got to pick. You've got ten trucks sitting there waiting. But you stop by and you brought him donuts. He's going to load your truck when he sees Dan Deacon trucking on the side of one, as opposed to JB Hunt, mm-hmm. who he does mm-hmm. from Adam. Mm-hmm. So that those and again, I guess it's touch points. I don't know. You're better with the the newer acronyms than I. But I would say that. That would be a great suggestion to any younger salesperson or so a salesperson who's never thought of that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the further you're in, 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 you're dug into them, the harder it is for them to get away. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, in closing, Bobby, what um, what are some of the things you would put out to some of the salespeople? Um, in today's market, uh, some, some just, I mean, I know we talked on a lot and I, I, I pretty much know exactly what's about to come out of your mouth, but I just want to reiterate to everybody that's, that's spent the last 35, 40 minutes listening to us, you know, major key takeaways for now heading into 2020, the next level of transportation sales. What are they? Be yourself, be able to take no for an answer because it is an answer. You're not going to mesh with everyone. You're going to gravitate to the people that you align with. Mm -hmm. Educate yourself every chance you get. Do the research on your customers and continue to, even once they're a customer. You want to know, hey, you know, Old Castle Concrete is just rolling out a new line where they're going to be, they're going to be building concrete enclosures. Well, I'm already hauling their drain tubs or I'm doing this for them. I want to know about this because I want to target who's ever in charge of that project. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, we're already providing. Because what you'll find in the bigger, as the, as corporations are bigger and bigger that you're dealing with, the more Fortune 500, whatever, that left hand never talks to the right hand. So you sometimes by those that educating yourself, you could be talking to your buddy Joe on the dock over here and not really understand, you know, and then you read something and say, hey, listen, Joe, do you know this guy Paul in procurement? Because they're looking for inbound freight and they're looking for qualified carriers that are ISN network or they're this or that. Oh, yeah, I can put you in touch with him. He's not thinking about that before. But if you have that relationship, he's more than happy to help you. You know what I'm saying? I, I guess those would be, that's the one thing I learned. You are more savoir faire, and I'm a little rough and tumble, always have been. I'm a Jersey boy, you know what I mean? No our, difference, brother, no difference. Yeah, but you know, sales, in the end, authenticity rules. So Yeah, our sales approaches are different, but you could sit either of us down at any table. We mm-hmm. could sit across from the CFO as well as we could sit with the shipping clerk on the dock. Mm-hmm. That app adaptability, uh, chameleon nature maybe, is something to to try to develop in yourselves if that's what you're going to do, you know. And and again, you you sell what you understand the best. You sell what you believe in the best. So you're selling you. Believe in you. Make yourself the best you you can be. That's an awesome way to end it, brother. Thank you so much for being here, buddy. And you know what? I couldn't have thought of a, a, a better way to kick off the next level with you, brother. I appreciate it. And it was a true pleasure. And the 30-plus years of friendship that started way back when, when we were both pissing in our diapers, basically, I wouldn't change it for the world, pal. We've Me been neither. through a lot. And we I can't wait to see the new adventures. Oh, it's going to be awesome, brother. Awesome. <laughs>